Hello and good afternoon to everyone. How many of you, this is your first VMworld? Yeah, are you enjoying it? Yeah, it's not my first, but I'm still enjoying it. How many in the audience are at your fifth VMworld? Anybody? Outstanding, thank you for continuing to come. It's a pretty good time, right? Everybody's having a good time, right? So my name is Dale McKay. I am an NSX TAS. If you are unfamiliar with the TAS program, please see me afterwards. I'll be glad to explain it to you. This is not, definitely not a presentation about the TAS program. It's a presentation about BGP best practices with NSX. How many people in the audience have deployed NSX? Okay, great. How many of you operate NSX with BGP? Okay, how many of you have a, a network staff that is unlimited resources and is the best network staff that you've ever had the chance to uh, work with? How many, how many are gonna raise your hands on that one? Nobody? All right, I kind of thought that might be the case. This BGP um, little lecture is specifically aimed at those organizations that don't have triple CCIEs working for them, that maybe need a little bit of distilling in terms of what are the BGP best practices. That's what I'm gonna cover. So we will talk about those best practices and we'll take a little look at some of the BGP configuration that you might find in your environment. What we're not gonna talk about is I'm not gonna teach you the BGP protocol. That would be a lot longer than we have in this session. We're also not gonna talk in depth about a leaf and spine architecture. How many of you implemented leaf and spine when you implemented NSX? All right, I'm gonna ask you a few questions about that in just a minute, but we're not gonna go in depth into the leaf and spine, nor will we talk about multi-protocol BGP. We also won't talk about BGP with IPv6. So those are the things we're not gonna talk about. Having said that, let's talk a little bit about this particular presentation. What I did was I looked at the VVD 4.2 documents. And I know if you keep track of VVD, you may say, well, 4.3 is out. Okay, uh, guilty. I haven't updated this presentation since 4.3 came out. But what I did was I looked at 4.2 and I tried to distill down what it was that somebody would need to know about BGP out of that document. One of the first things that we need to talk about, a lot of people raised their hands when I said, did you implement a leaf and spine architecture? How many of you implemented a layer three leaf and spine architecture? Okay, one, two, all right, three. What we mean by leaf and spine, or layer three at leaf and spine is obviously the fact that the layer two domain terminates at the top of the rack switch. Is that the only way you can do leaf and spine? Absolutely not. But for the purpose of this presentation, that's gonna be our focus, is gonna be on a layer three leaf and spine architecture. We're also gonna Make sure that we talk about dynamic routing, routing protocols. Obviously, we're here to talk about BGP, but you also know that OSPF could be used. That might be possible. And you can see some of the uh, guiding principles in this layer three leaf and spine architecture. We're gonna advertise a small set of prefixes. Everybody's okay with that term prefix. If you're doing BGP, you ought to know what that means. We're gonna have equal cost paths to the other racks. The switch is gonna provide the default gateway or be the termination point for our layer two domain at the top of the rack switch. We'll probably have some 802.1Q trunks. And like I said, for the rest of this particular session, we're gonna assume that this is a layer three topology. Everybody okay with this so far? I didn't lose anybody yet. Any questions? Everybody's good? 
All right. First thing that you need to do when you're going to use BGP with NSX, particularly in the Software Defined Data Center, is you need to make that decision. Are you going to have layer two or layer three? And if you need um, some additional material to help you make that decision, I put the RFC numbers in there, RFC 7938. That would be a good one for you to go and read. A couple of things to point out about BGP. A lot of people are pretty familiar with OSPF. They like OSPF. But OSPF does have some issues. And one of them is the fact that you need to design for area zero or you have to implement virtual links, right? Virtual links get complicated. It's something else to break. With BGP, obviously, we don't have that requirement to design for area zero. It, I've worked with customers that had OSPF. It's a workable situation for sure. But if you're designing this in a greenfield environment, why would you do that? In my opinion, there'd be no good reason for you to do that. Another thing, and this is probably one of the more important points of my entire presentation, is that you need to go in and adjust the BGP timers. Now, you're going to hear me mention some other important parts here in a few minutes, but this one's pretty important because by default, you can see that the Cisco values, and this assumes that we're using Cisco top of the rack switches or Cisco spine switches, the keep alive timer is at 60, and this is a, again, recommendation right out of VVD 4.2 that from the uh, top of the rack switch to the ESG, if you look at the bottom set of values there, we take that 60 number and we drop it down to four. That's a pretty significant change. If you don't do that, what's gonna happen is as you have changes, your network is gonna lag in terms of digesting those changes and adjusting to those changes. So that's a pretty important thing. You can see that there's actually two different sets of values. There's a set of values between the top of the rack and the ESGs, and then there's also a different set of values between the UDLR and the ESG. Everybody's okay with those terms, right? Edge Service Gateway, Universal Distributed Logical Router, everybody knows what those mean, right? All right, good. Next, if you're gonna do BGP, it's probably worth you understanding how loop avoidance works in BGP. Is everybody familiar with loop avoidance? Because loops are bad, right? We've always known that, whether it's layer two and we're doing spanning tree, or whether it's layer three and we're trying to prevent routing loops, loops are bad. How, do, how, how does the BGP protocol handle that? Well, that depends on whether we're talking about eBGP or IBGP. Everybody's okay with that term, right? External or internal, right? It's just simply who's my neighbor is what that comes down to. Is my neighbor external to my AS or is it internal my, to my AS? You can see that in an external BGP environment, I'm looking for my AS path. If I see my AS path, I know there's a problem because I shouldn't be seeing my AS path coming back to me. In IBGP, you can see what BGP, and this is directly out of the RFC. You know, this is not me sitting there typing it. This is directly out of the RFC. In IBGP, we're not going to redistribute routing information contained in that update message to other internal peers. If you worked with BGP, you know this is one of the early things that you learn about dealing with EGP is loop avoidance. But it's something that bears repeating in terms of understanding how BGP is going to work with NSX. Another thing that we need to talk about is the need to use filters. Notice, uh, and, and this, this slide might be the one slide, I know I sit in a, in a lot of the sessions, and man, the cameras come up, everybody takes a picture of the slide. Thank you, Jason. This might be the particular slide that you want to take a picture of. This probably summarizes the whole presentation almost in one slide. First, if you're going to do BGB peering, one of the most important things that you can do is to do those steps that I have listed there. Define what prefixes need to be announced. 
use good summarization techniques. You know, good summarization techniques. Some of the people in the audience have uh, heard me give a subnet lecture. If you're having a problem with summarization, I'd be glad to give you that subnet lecture on the side, teach you how to subnet visually. You'll never need a subnet calculator again. It's a little math trick. Where does that calculate in? That calculates into being able to summarize. If you can't summarize, you're gonna have a problem. So make sure you do good summarization techniques. And lastly, you wanna define filters at every e EBGP peer. That's gonna be important. If you don't filter, you can see, I talked about it, it can have some disastrous consequences. Why? Because you're gonna get routes that you don't need into the routing table, and some of the routes are gonna probably not direct traffic where you want it to go. Again, this is one of the more important slides of the presentation. Do not distribute BGP prefixes into an IBGP. Don't do it. I mean, think about what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to tell the VMs or uh, the host that are inside of that IBGP, we're not trying to tell them all about the outside. We don't need to announce to them every route that's in BGP. We simply need to tell them where do they need to go to get out of that environment. All right, so if you have that mindset, that'll serve you well. Also, don't distribute IGBP routes into BGP. Again, same thing. I don't need to advertise to the world what my internal addresses are. I don't even need to advertise much beyond my next neighbor what those addresses are. And lastly, don't use an IBGP. Everybody's okay with I IGP, right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about, interior gateway protocol. Don't use an IGP to carry EBGP pre prefixes. In other words, don't do route redistribution. It's pretty simple. Let's take a look at some of the filters that you might need to apply. Those of you that had did NSX, you raised your hand and said you were doing it, and you said you were doing it BGP. Did you apply route filters? They look like this at the Cisco level. So when you, I'm not gonna walk you through every line, but when you look at this filter, we're essentially allowing one single prefix out which is exactly what we want to do. We don't need to allow a bunch of prefixes out, we just need to allow that one. Next, coming in, this is a uh, filter that's gonna filter out all the prefixes except those that I want to come into my environment. And you can see what those are, the 225.50.0.0 and the 16 the 61, 237, 64, 0 on the 18, and then the 81, 250, 128, 0 on the 17. Everything else gets denied. That's the type of filtering, coherent, understandable filtering that needs to be done to make BGP be efficient in your environment. If you're not doing filters today, when you leave here, go home and put filters in, please. It's gonna make things a lot simpler and it's gonna work a lot better. How can you verify some of this? Well, in this particular case, I'm logged into ESG. Those of you that work with BGP, whether it's virtual or physical, know what to look for, right? You're gonna look for BGP state of established. All right, that's the word that you wanna see there is established. If I'm in the UDLR, again, what is it that I'm looking for? that word established. We, I, I think most of us came from a physical networking background, I know I did. This isn't any different than what we would see if we were doing this in a physical environment. Still gonna be established. We're still gonna have a routing table, it's gonna look like this, right? Everybody should be familiar with this, those of you that have a networking background. The 20 is the admin distance for a BGP derived route. And you can see also by the B in that first column that it tells me that that route was derived from BGP. 
I wish I had a gift to give away. Anybody tell me what that C route means down there? Connected, absolutely. And it has an admin distance of zero, which is what we would expect to see. Notice that we're doing this, in this particular case, we're doing this from the UDLR, but you can also do it from the ESG. Last, let's take a look at what this overall picture now should look like. And this is right out of the VVD documentation. Remember the VVD documentation is a, a two-site uh, premise for that documentation. And you can see that we have our cores and we have our top of the racks. You know, if we look at the top of the rack switches, it says EBGP to the core. So that should tell you something. You can see, I don't know if the pointer will work. No. You can see right here that this has an AS number and what's not written is you had a different AS number. How do I know if that's going to be a different AS number? Because we're doing EBGP. Definition of EBGP is two different AS numbers. We're also doing EBG, uh, EBG, EBGP, sorry, to the ESGs. So again, what's that tell you? That tells you that this AS number is going to be different than this AS number. Again, definition of EBGP. We're going to do a default originate to the ESGs. Everybody should be comfortable with that, right? We're going to advertise default route to the uh, ESGs. And then we may do some route maps to do some specific traffic steering. Everybody's good with route maps also, right? Assuming, right? Let's take a look at the ESGs. We're going to do, um, we're, from an ESG perspective, we're going to do EBGP to the uh, top of the rack. We're going to do IBGP with the UDLRs. So again, that'll tell you something about how you're going to break out your AS numbers. And then we're going to advertise a static summary route for those UDLR subnets. We can also redistribute the connected routes. And then lastly, if we go down and we look at the UDLR, this is where we're going to do IBGP with the ESGs. That makes sense. We're going to put a higher weight depending upon which site we want to favor. And then we're going to redistribute the connected routes and also deny the UDLR subnets between those two sites. Right. All right, any questions from anyone? Yes, Melvin. Yes. Yeah, here, let me go back. So her question was timers. And here's the value on the timers. All right. What? I can't hear you. Sorry. Are those the recommended values? Because it says default values. All right. So these are the default values for, say, your top of the rack switch. This is default Cisco values. This is between the UDLR and the ESGs. And then this would be between the top of the rack the Cisco's and the ESG. So obviously you're going to adjust your Cisco timers and then you're also going to go in and adjust the timers on the ESG. Yes, those are recommended right out of the VVD 4.2 documentation. Again, that's what we're doing with BGP is we're because we decrease the timer value so much, we now make BGP much more of a higher performing uh, protocol than maybe what it was before, where we waited 180 seconds before we declared something down. All right, any more questions? Great, thank you very much. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.